Welcome to Vision Church. My name is Kenny Mills and I'm the executive pastor here at Vision. We're excited that you chose to join us to watch this sermon online today. But one of the things that we wanted to tell you about is that we're walking through a very special season here at Vision Church. See, God's placed an opportunity in front of us to purchase a building and to make it our own. And so we're walking through a season that we're calling Our Bold Move, because as a church, we believe in making bold moves, and we've done that. We've went under contract on this building, and we're asking you to partner with us to see this thing fully come to life. There's a couple of ways that you can partner with us to see this building and this vision come to fruition. The first is that we would ask for you to pray for us. Pray for provision and pray for protection over this season as we continue to see what God's got for us. The other way that you can be a part of this is by giving. Right on the link below, you can give in two different ways. The first is that you could give a pledge. This is an opportunity for you to give incrementally over the course of 12 months. The other way that you can give is to click on the link below and to give a one-time gift today. Either way, we just wanna tell you, thank you for partnering with Vision Church. We believe God's called us to this bold move and we're excited to invite you in to be a part of it as well. We know that this is a sacrifice for you and a bold move for you as well. And we pray that God blesses you during the season. And we thank you again for your gift. If you have your Bible, turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 24. And we're gonna begin in verse 44. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 44. I'm really excited about this series. I've been loving it so far. In case you missed last week, we are in a series called Unlocking the Old Testament. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to throughout the years, mainly Christians, who they tell me that they don't read the Old Testament. They just skip right over it because they don't see it as relevant or applicable to their lives today. And I just wanna caution you from that type of thinking if you do that, you're missing over half of the Bible. And number two, I want you to be reminded that the entire Bible is the inspired Word of God. It didn't just start with the inspiration in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It started all the way back in Genesis. God has a message that He wants each and every one of us to understand, and it begins in the Old Testament. And it absolutely is relevant to your life. And so my hope is that through the conclusion of this series, I pray that you are equipped with the tools to be able to read the Old Testament for yourself and unlock its truth and its value that can be applied to your life right now. Many theologians have said it this way, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I love that. And uh, if you did miss last Sunday, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the key to unlocking the Old Testament right now out of the gate. The key to unlocking and understanding every story, every genealogy, every chapter in the Old Testament is Jesus. Look at your neighbor and tell them the key is Jesus. The key is Jesus. Luke chapter 24 beginning in verse 44. These are his words. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and be raised from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins of all who repent. And that's all I want to read right there. This is incredible. Jesus says right here in Luke 24, he says, everything that you read about from Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, in other words, the Old Testament, it was all speaking of me. I am the truth that was concealed in the Old Testament. And the Bible says that as his disciples understood that Jesus was the, the main element in the Old Testament, 
In verse 45, the Bible says their minds were opened and they began to see the Old Testament in an entirely new light. And my prayer for you this morning is that your minds would be opened, that when you read the Old Testament, it unfolds beautifully before you, bringing life, hope, and truth into your present day. Also, John chapter five, verse 39, Jesus said to those who were listening, he said, you seek life in the Old Testament, but I tell you that all of it testifies of me. Now that was a really bold thing for Jesus to say, a really, really bold thing. And that's why many of the Pharisees and religious leaders of his day despised him. Imagine the audacity. That was their Bible of the day. The Old Testament was their Bible, their Torah. That was it, all they had. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he's like, hey, all that Old Testament, that Torah that you've been reading and devoting your life to is talking about me. You think you have life in the text, but the text is pointing to life, which is me. It was an audacious statement that Jesus made, but he again is reiterating that the entire Old Testament points forward to one message, one person, one gospel, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Come on, somebody, if you see it. It's amazing. Y'all are already out hyping the 930, and I'm loving it. I thought I was in a funeral home at the first service. I was like, what? But I told him, it's all right. I love you anyway. I'll get hyped by myself. And by the way, when you get hyped and excited at Vision Church, let me just let you know something. You are not getting hyped and excited for me. I don't deserve your applause, but his word deserves a response from the earth when you see the word of God spoken before men. It deserves a response. So I will get hyped with you because you're not clapping for me. It's not about a person. It's about Jesus. The entire Old Testament points forward to the cross. The entire New Testament points backwards to the cross. And when you read a story, a chapter, or a book in the Old Testament, and you do not understand it, I want to challenge you to look at it through the lens of the person of Jesus and watch the context unfold right before your eyes. If you try to understand the Old Testament, Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, whatever, through the lens of your 21st century perspective, you will be confounded, confused, and you'll be like, what? What in the world's going on here? But if you look at it through the person that is Jesus, you will begin to understand it. Oh, and this just came to me. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things that were made were made through Him. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Come on, somebody. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. Woo! Thank you, Lord. That wasn't in the notes, but man, I'm feeling that. Wow. Woo! The Word became flesh. So when you're looking at the Old Testament, you're trying to understand what it means. I want to challenge you in the characters, in the examples, look for who represents Jesus. And when you discover who represents Jesus, then you can discover who represents you. And I shared this little hint with you last week, and I'm going to share it with you again. Hint. In the Old Testament, you are not the hero in the story. You are the sinner. You are the prostitute, the blind guy, the beggar, the one that's in need. That's you. You're the sinner. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're the sinner. You're the sinner. I know you want to be David taking down Goliath. I know you want to be Joshua and Caleb. I know you want to be Moses, but you're not. You're the sinner. All right? <laughs> Jesus is the hero. We are the ones in need of a savior. So if you're reading it any other way, you're messing it up. So last week I talked to you about Jesus in Genesis, but this morning I want to talk to you about Jesus in the Exodus. Jesus in the Exodus. And y'all, it's about to get wild in here. I'm excited already. Turn with me if you have your Bible to Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse 4. Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse 4. This is incredible. I want to tell you about the story of the bronze serpent. Today I'm going to take three examples in the journey of the Exodus. And I'm going to show you how Jesus unlocks these stories and brings life and truth into our world right now. Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse four. Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey and they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. 
There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and speaking against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8. Then the Lord told him, make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who were bitten by the snake will live if they will simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. And then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. So I want to read right there. Now, look, if you're looking at that verse through your 21st century mindset, you're going to be like, what in the world is going on in here? These people are complaining, and then the snakes come out, start biting everybody, they're dying, and then they build a bronze snake and lift it up, and people get healed. So you're like, this does not apply to me. I don't understand. Yes, it does apply to you, and I'm going to show you that Jesus is the key that unlocks it, all right? First of all, can we just take a side note real quick and say, do any of y'all get frustrated when you read about the Israelites? Anybody get frustrated when you read about them? I mean, think about it. These are the people that the Lord rescued from slavery in Egypt. These are the people that watched 10 plagues fall on Pharaoh. They watched the oceans part and they walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Lord provided manna every morning throughout their journey in the wilderness to feed them. It probably tasted like Chick-fil-A chicken minis, just my, my commentary. Anyway, the Lord, he says, taste and see, the Lord is good. So I bet you that, that manna was good. Anyway, the Lord had been providing. He had been showing up in their life time and time and time again. And then you read a verse like this and the people are complaining and now they're calling the man a horrible and they're like, what are you doing? Did you bring us out here to die? Now are you frustrated with the Israelites? It's like, come on, people. You, you're afraid to raise your hand because you know where I'm going. Because guess who the Israelites represent? You and me. And the frustrations that we feel in our soul when we read about the Israelites are a mirror reflecting back upon our life that show us God has done so much for us. God has shown up in our life time and time again. He has provided, he has made a way, yet we still lend to follow our fear instead of our faith. We end up complaining, being negative and bitter, even after God has done so much in our life. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're the Israelites. Tell them like you mean it. You're the Israelites. I know you want to be the hero, but you're the one complaining over in the corner. It's just the word. So look at this. I'm just going to, as we unlock this story and we recognize that we are the Israelites, I want to show you this. Complaining attracts the snakes. I'm going to say that one more time. That, that, that complaining, bitter, critical, negative spirit is attractive to the serpents. Mm, I'm, just try, I'm just trying to preach to somebody today. The Israelites out here complaining, being hypercritical, negative, that's what attracted the serpents. They were just slithering out of everywhere, coming at them, all right? And I truly believe that this is a depiction. It's a warning to you and I as believers. May we be grateful. May we be thankful with our life and not lend towards negativity and a critical spirit. Our complaining attracts darkness. It attracts the bite of the serpent. You're going to reap what you sow. If you sow of the flesh, of the flesh you shall reap corruption. If you're always speaking neg negativity, always being critical of other people, People, that's going to come back to bite you in the end. No pun intended. Pun is intended. It's going to bite you. Now, some of y'all today call this karma. You're like, karma. You know, you were just exuding negative energy. And so it's going to come back and get you. Would y'all stop with that? The Bible had it right before karma and the Buddhists ever did. All right. He told you that if you're sowing of the flesh and you're being negative, the serpents are going to come out and bite you. It's going to come back to bite you. Look at your neighbor tell them it's going to come back to bite you. So stop being critical of one another. Stop being critical of all the churches. Stop being critical of God and why he didn't show up and answer you like you thought he should. Stop with the critical spirit because you can't be critical and worship at the same time. you got to choose. Now look at this. The Lord sent the snakes. 
I know that might mess with your theology, but the people were complaining and the Lord sent the snakes. He's like, go ahead on out there. And I'll be honest with you, I looked up like the Hebrew and the Aramaic and I was like, did the Lord really send the snakes? Yes, he sent the snakes. The Lord really did send them, all right? And you might be like, well, that's cruel and why is God sending the snakes? And because if you keep reading the passage, the serpents are what ultimately led the Israelites to repentance. It was the tragedy, it was the chaos that God had allowed into their camp that ultimately drove them to their knees and into repentance where they said, all right, Father, forgive us, we've sinned against you and Moses. And some of y'all might be like, why did God allow sin? Why does he allow evil? Why does he allow suffering in my life? And there might just be a strong link right here that he allows it for repentance. Because if your life was 75 and sunny, homie, you might not just be thinking about God. You might be out doing your own thing. Sometimes it's the suffering. It's the darkness. It's the valleys that drive us to repentance. It's amazing stuff right here. And one other just real quick note. The people, they prayed and they said, Father, remove these snakes from our camp. And the Lord did answer their prayer, but just not the way they expected The Lord did not remove the fiery serpents from the Israelites. He didn't answer their prayer the way they thought he should, but he did something even greater. He provided a way for their healing. And some of you be sitting in here today with your arms folded, thinking that God is angry with you. He's not listening to you. He's not answering your prayer. And let me just say, Israelites, is it possible that God has answered your prayer? Is it possible that God has shown up in your life? He just made provision that was higher than what you were asking for. You asked for the serpents to flee and the Lord provided ultimate healing. Could it be that he answered your prayer? It just came in a way you didn't expect. And you thought the Old Testament didn't apply today. It does. It does indeed. Now, that was the foundation for here's where we're going. This, you are represented in the Israelites. The snakes represent your sin and mine. The wages of sin is death. And the bronze serpent that was lifted upon the pole represents Jesus Christ, the Lord. I can feel somebody in here right now. Maybe you're online. You're like, my Jesus is definitely not a snake. Like I'm not seeing that. I refuse that. I hate snakes. I'm with you. But he is the snake right here. Jesus is the bronze serpent. And when you understand this, it unlocks this story into an entirely new dimension. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, He who knew no sin became sin so that you could be called the righteousness of God through him. I don't know if you heard what I'm saying to you, but Jesus, the spotless, sinless, pure lamb of God became sin on Calvary's cross so that you could be called righteous. That picture of that bronze, wicked, poisonous serpent, that is the depiction of your sin and mine. That's what your pride looks like. That's what your greed, your lust, your envy, that's what your selfish will looks like that serpent on that cross. Jesus became your sin and he became mine on Calvary's rugged cross. Jesus is the bronze serpent in Numbers 21. Flip with me another verse here. John chapter 3 verse 13. Some of y'all are still like, my Jesus is not a snake. I'm going to show you right now. John chapter 3 beginning in verse 13. Y'all, I'm not making this stuff up. The Bible is alive. Jesus unlocks the Old Testament. Watch this right here. I'm going to start in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but find life everlasting. Come on, somebody. Isn't it amazing? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He is 
the bronze serpent. And just like Moses lifted up that bronze serpent in the wilderness, so Christ Jesus will be lifted up. He said of himself, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Blessed be the Lamb of God. He became our sin. Galatians 3 says that he became our curse. Cursed is the one who hangs upon the tree. Jesus became our sin. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Another reason that that serpent was not fashioned out of gold or silver, but bronze, is because bronze is an impure metal. It's a metal with many great impurities on it. If you ever watch the Olympic Games, the person who came in third gets the bronze because the bronze is less pure than the gold. And the impurity is represented in the bronze serpent. He became our iniquity, our sins. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He bore our sin and our impurities. Man, y'all, this is amazing. I'm reading to you from the book of Numbers. This is from the book of Numbers that, that was written by a shepherd, all right? This is the inspired word of the living God. A shepherd could have never written that, lest it be the inspiration of the spirit of the living God. Can I tell you one other mind-blowing thing? This is just free on the side. It's all free. Anyway, have you seen an, amb have you seen an ambulance? Hopefully you haven't been in one, but if you've looked at one, there's a cross, and what's in the middle of the cross? A pole with a serpent wrapped around it. That's still the symbol of healing today. Where did they get it? All the way back in Exodus. Jesus, next time you see an ambulance, you just go ahead and give the Lord, throw up some praise hands, because that's preaching the gospel. Jesus became my sin so that I could become healed and righteous. Isn't that amazing? Some of y'all doctors curse in the name of the Lord and you're wearing his gospel on your chest. You can try to suppress the truth, but it'll still triumph in victory. And I'm so hyped right now. I love this. Can we just stay in this series for a minute? Let's just stay here. It's amazing. Another facet before we move on is that all who looked upon the bronze serpent were healed. They didn't have to do anything but just look at it. Did you read it? If you have been bitten, just look to the bronze serpent and you'll be healed. In other words, you are not saved by your own good works. You are not saved by your own human achievement or effort. You are saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ and his cross alone. You are not saved by your good works, lest any man should boast. You are saved and secured by the finished work of Jesus Christ. All you got to do, repent of your sins and look to his cross and you shall be saved. Man, let that just rush over your soul today. Find peace in that. It's amazing. All right, the second illustration is found in Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 2. Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 2. First, I talked about the bronze serpent. Now I want to show you about the rock in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse 2. So once more, the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people, take your staff, the one you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Now, this is amazing right here. And this is just one of those Old Testament verses and chapters that we just kind of glaze over. Just like, okay, that's kind of weird. People are thirsty. The Lord strikes up a water fountain in the middle of the wilderness. That doesn't mean anything to me today. Oh, yes, it does. The Old Testament is so rich. I pray that you see this. So guess who you are again in this story? You're the complaining Israelites. Again, congratulations. That's who you are. 
The Lord has done so much for you and you're still out here complaining. Still out here doubting. You're complaining to God. You brought me out here to die. You're gonna, we're gonna die of thirst. And the Bible says something amazing here that the Israelites were so compelled by their thirst that they were ready to stone Moses. If you study it a little bit deeper, their argument against Moses, he was actually on trial right here in Exodus 17, like a legit trial. And the people of Israel were saying, Moses should be stoned to death because he has broken the covenant of our salvation. Yes, he delivered us. God through him delivered us. But now we're about to die in the wilderness. Let's stone this guy. The weight of the people's judgment was upon Moses. But I want you to see what happens here. Turn with me really quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 4. What I'm going to show you is absolutely beautiful. And again, I want to show you this so you don't think I'm making this up. I want you to see that this is your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 4. <clears throat> Actually, I'm going to back up to verse 1. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. <laughs> Jesus is the rock in the wilderness. Now, let me put this together for you. And it's imperative that you feel this. You've got to feel this. Moses is leading over one million people through Sinai's wilderness peninsula. They are crazy. They are complaining. Nothing God ever does is good enough. He is weary. They're in the desert. People are thirsty. Revolutionary concept. The people decide we're going to kill you, Moses. We're going to stone you right here and right now. We're going to go back to Egypt because at least as a slave in Egypt, we had it better than a nomad in the wilderness. Moses, in his disparity, falls before the father in prayer. And he says, Father, what am I going to do with these rebels? What am I going to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. This is his prayer of desperation. It's do or die right now. And God says to Moses, I want you to go back at the base of Sinai. I want you to stand on that rock. I want you to assemble the people together. And I want you to take that staff that you lifted over the Red Sea. And I want you to strike the rock with it. And out of the rock will gush living water that will revive and save this nation. Now listen, what God was really saying to Moses, he was preaching the gospel to Moses. He's saying, Moses, the people are calling for your death, but instead I want you to strike me. I want you to strike the rock and I will take your death. I will take the blow that rightfully belongs to you. I will take the brunt of your curse on me and out of it, I will bring salvation and life to all who come and drink from the fountain of my salvation. Do you see this? This is amazing. Jesus was the rock of our salvation all the way back in Exodus 17. Jesus was struck for our judgment and for our sin. The rock took the penalty that belonged to Moses and it freed Moses from death that was at the hands of the Israelites. Now I'm about to just really lose it right now. You ready? We're gonna go just another step deeper. You ready? Look at your neighbor, ask him, are you ready? I want you now to place your mind at Calvary Golgotha, the place of the cross. I want you to remember what happened on that cross as Jesus and his body was suspended between heaven and earth. The life had slipped from 
his body. The Roman soldier took a spear and thrust it, struck it into the side of the rock of our salvation. And the Bible says that from his side burst a fountain of water and blood that would bring healing to the nations. Jesus was the rock of our salvation. And all the way back in Exodus, when Moses struck the rock and it burst forth with a fountain, it was foreshadowing all the way to Calvary's cross that the rock of our salvation would be struck and from him would burst forth a fountain, a life-giving salvation to an entire nation and to all who would call and believe upon his name. Jesus looked at the woman at Jacob's well in John 4 and he said, if you drink from the water of this well, you will get thirsty again, but I am the fountain who will never run dry. And if you drink of my spirit, you will never thirst again. He's saying, I'm the fountain of living water. I am the fountain of your salvation. And, and listen, that water in the wilderness, it didn't just sustain their life, but it brought refreshing into their life. It brought joy. It brought hope. It brought peace. Come on, somebody, if you see it, let's give the Lord praise in this place. One last thought on this one. If you read 1 Corinthians 10, 4 again closely, you will see that Paul says, the rock that was Christ, it traveled with them all throughout the wilderness. That rock traveled with them through the wilderness. I couldn't help but read that in my mind immediately go back to the angel who appeared before Mary, that virgin who had conceived Christ immaculately. And the angel said, you are with a child and you shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. God is with you. God was with the Israelites in every valley, every crevice of the wilderness, when they were completely unaware, that rock of their salvation was with them through every step, through every trial, through every snake bite, through every disappointment, he was there all along. He is Emmanuel, and just like he was with the Israelites, God is with you. He is Emmanuel, God with you when you feel him, God with you when he feels like he's a million miles away. He is the rock of your salvation who is always with you. Come on, somebody. If you're thankful for a God who never abandoned you, he never rejected you. My God, my God. Third and final example, Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. I mentioned this illustration a couple weeks ago, but I'm going to go a little deeper on it now. And that is, I've shown you that he is the bronze serpent. I've shown you that Jesus is the rock in the wilderness. And now I'm going to show you that he is the Passover lamb. Do you see how Jesus is the key that unlocks the Old Testament? And can I just say this to you? You can never hear the gospel too much. You can never hear this story too many times. And if you haven't noticed, every story is pointing to it. It's God's plan of salvation for you. I don't know about you, and listen, if you've been to church for 30 minutes or for 30 years, you will never hear the gospel too many times that you were a sinner saved by the grace of God. And for he who knew no sin became sin, that you could be the righteousness of God. You'll never hear it too many times because number one, I don't know about you, but it makes me love him more every time I hear it. It makes my heart more gracious every time I hear it. It makes my worship just a little bit sweeter every time I hear it. Every time I hear it, I'm reminded of my place and I'm reminded of his. You will never hear the gospel too many times. And if you're like, well, at Vision, all he preaches is the gospel. You're welcome. I won't stop it. We're going to keep it going. You're going to hear it all, always. Well, it's a broken record. Well, I'm just reading you the Bible and I'm just showing you what it's telling you. Over and over and over again, you will see the gospel from many different perspectives. 
Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, then let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of the family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. Now watch this. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the doorframe of the houses. Skip down with me to verse 12. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and I will strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against the land of Egypt and all of their gods, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and this plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Again, you and I are represented in the Israelites. This time they're not complaining, but there is certain death that is approaching them. Moses is warning the Israelites, the spirit of death is coming. The hour of your salvation is drawing near. We're at the twilight. The spirit of death is coming. So you must choose a lamb, one without spot or blemish, and take the blood of the lamb and smear it upon the sides of the doorpost and the top of the doorposts, cover it in the blood. Number one, how this applies to you is to every one of us, the spirit of death is coming. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. There is an ultimate reality that awaits every one of us. And that is that we will either die here on earth or will we, we will be raptured by the presence of God when he returns. But at the end, the spirit of death is coming for every one of us. Moses instructed the Israelites, he said, every family must choose. Every family has a choice. You can choose a lamb or you can choose a goat. Now, later on in the gospels, you'll discover that at the great judgment, he separates the sheep from the goats. The goats were the ones who were wicked and unrighteous, those who trusted in their own human effort. They didn't rely on Christ and his cross. They thought it was foolishness. They were the goats. And those who chose to fall at the foot of the cross and trust in Jesus, they were considered the lambs. Every one of you has a choice. Death is approaching, it will. Every second, every moment, we are racing towards the end. And it is appointed unto man wants to die and then the judgment. And every one of you has a choice and you will either choose the lamb or you will choose a goat. It's up to you. You cannot remain indifferent. And the Bible says that the lamb that you should choose should be the one without blemish, the one without any indiscrepancies, the one that is whole. This is not God being cruel. This is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, who would be the Lamb of God, sinless Lamb of God, without blemish of sin, without brokenness, without iniquity found in him. It was pointing forward. And guess who the Passover Lamb is? Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verse 29, the Bible says of John the Baptist, when he first laid eyes on Jesus coming down the road, he said something powerful. 
He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. My God, do you see it? John was referencing all the way back to Exodus 12. Behold the Lamb. The Lamb in Exodus, in Egypt, it was only a foreshadowing of the ultimate Messiah, the Son of God, who would come for us. And I love this. He said, smear the blood of the lamb on the doorpost because even though the spirit of death is coming, there's one thing that causes death to pass over you. There's one thing that holds back judgment. There's one thing that holds back death and it is the blood of the lamb. Every house, every dwelling place that was covered in the blood was saved from imminent destruction. And any dwelling place that was not marked by his blood tasted death. But I want to show you something amazing. Exodus 12 was not just hinting or foreshadowing of the cross. The cross was preached in Exodus right before your eyes. I want you to watch what this doorpost really is. This doorpost, he says it clearly in Exodus 12. He mentions three pieces to the doorpost. Put the blood on both sides and on the top of the door frame. Mentions three, three posts. When you see this, I want you to erupt and give the Lord great praise in this place. Exodus was not just talking about a door. Exodus was talking about the cross of Calvary. Come on, somebody, and bless him like you mean it. This is all the way in Exodus. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way to the Father. And neither is there salvation in any other name. For there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved than the name of Jesus. Come on, Vision Church, one more time and praise the Lord. Bless his name. We love you. You are the door. You are the way. You are our salvation. And Revelation chapter 12 says this. It says, you are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. Let me help you see it. You see, Satan, the great dragon of Revelation 12, he's the lowercase God of this world and he reigns over you until you place your trust in Jesus until you mark your soul by the blood of the Lamb and the moment that you are covered in the blood of the Lamb by faith, you are transitioned from a sinner to a saint. You are someone who was overwhelmed to someone who is now overcome. You are an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. Are you worthy? No. Are you righteous? No. Are you a sinner? Yes. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only son for you. And whoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the message. This is what the Old Testament is all about. It's the Old Testament is the gospel concealed and the New Testament is the gospel revealed. I want to pray over you right now. Father, we come to you in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that this morning that you would give your people the gift of faith. Holy Spirit, move and blow through this place. Convict every heart. Touch every life. Forgive us of our sin. Thank you that you love us so much that your entire book is pointing us to one person, one message. The gospel is simple. It's so simple a child could receive it. It sounds like foolishness to the lost. It sounds like foolishness to those who are prideful and want to earn their own way. But it is the simplicity of the gospel that brings life and life abundantly. 
You are the fountain that never runs dry. You are the only one who can satisfy the human soul. You became our sin so that we, we could become righteous. And this morning we look to you. This morning we receive the blood of the Passover lamb. This morning, Jesus, we give you our past, our present, and our future. If you're in this room right now, I want you to keep your head bowed, your eyes closed. If you're in this room and right now you know that you're not right with God, you know that you've been ignoring God, you've been loving the things created, not the Creator Himself, and if you were to die right now, you don't know if the spirit of death and hell would pass over you or not. There's uncertainty there. You've never publicly accepted Jesus. You've never, see, because putting the blood on the doorpost was a public thing. It wasn't something you could be ashamed of. It wasn't something you could hide. All your neighbors, everybody else saw it. You cannot be ashamed of the gospel, for this is the power of God and His salvation. If you've never publicly asked God to forgive you and received His finished work on the cross, I want you right now to pray this prayer with me. Father, I repent before a holy God. And today, by faith, I believe that Jesus is enough for me. His cross sealed my salvation. I believe that He died on the cross and three days later was resurrected from the dead, demonstrating power over death, hell, and the grave. And because He lives, I too shall live also. Give me strength. Give me your spirit to follow you and to serve you all the days of my life. It is in Jesus' precious name. Amen.